That's almost a modern version of um, of the gold, you know, oh, one of the gold rushes, you bet. isn't it? Alaska's life, at Alaska has lived through a lot of booms and busts, <laughs> a lot, and the oil the oil boom was certainly very much on the order of the gold gold rush. Well, to me, that was a very special book because I'd been there. I was so surprised. Uh, it was so sybaritic in compared to, mm -hmm. you know, the normal kind of frontier <laughs> condition. You're certainly right that Kate um, is, you know, gazes at all this array and really has to um, wrestle with herself a little bit, as anybody would. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you have that, a wonderful sidebar plot with um, the artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, the old Alaskan culture kind of as an offset to all mm -hmm. of this and uh, the fraud that is perpetrated or could be perpetrated with people who were forging <laughs> or otherwise ripping off. The pipeline, you know, the discovery of oil at Prudhoe Bay certainly saved Alaska financially, um, but it opened up a lot of other doors and mm -hmm. that might, you know, I suppose eventually were going to be opened at one time or another, but opened them earlier and this was definitely one of them. Um, people were going into places where, uh, going into to sites where, you know, all the Alaskans, Native Alaskans were hunter-gatherers and they were, they, they followed the caribou, they were migratory. They followed the caribou, they followed the salmon up the river, you know, in the summer and they followed the caribou in the winter to eat. So there are just tons of little, little settlements with all kinds of wonderful, marvelous little artifacts that, you know, were abandoned and then were found again by this tremendous influx <laughs> sure, <laughs> and probably arising in at least in part from this was an exhibit called the Crossroads of Continents which I don't know if it still exists I don't know if it became a permanent exhibit somewhere but it was um, a collection of artifacts put together from uh, Yupik and Aleut and Siberian Yupik peoples and it was fabulous but oh my god did it alert people to the possibility of acquiring native Alaskan artifacts and um, alerted also villagers to the idea that they could loot burial grounds and sell the artifacts off for much needed money for one reason or another. Well, I assume that you intended that contrast between the riches mm -hmm. flowing from underground and the riches yes. um, up on the surface there. That actually was deliberate, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was. <laughs> it's an interesting thing because it's been so much explored in our own Southwest literature. Oh, yes. In Tony Hillerman's books, mm -hmm. uh, more than one, archaeologists or unscrupulous art dealers or unscrupulous archaeologists are the villains. In fact, mm -hmm. I was greatly surprised to attend um, a national, I can't remember, it's a very glamorous title, but anyway, it was a, a uh, convention of archaeologists, world famous convention, and Lindsay Davis and Stephen Saylor and Aaron Elkins had all been invited to address uh, this group at one point about classical and other kinds of archaeology. So I, I went, otherwise I wouldn't have had any reason to be there. But what absolutely amazed me is that Tony Hillerman is really reviled by archaeologists because they're most often the villains in his books and they had this kind of grudge thing. I mean, I was so surprised because I'd never thought about it from their standpoint. But I can see that, you know, in, in your book um, or in any place where there is a culture that has left Mm -hmm. these kinds of um, treasures to be found and exploited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that it would be a natural thing. It's, let's face it, it's the American, you know, it's the American national pa pastime to make a buck. And if you can find something to make a buck off, by God, get out of my way. Like and book collecting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How true. <laughs> the person who's been dipping at Barnes and Noble is the same spirit as the guy who's ripping up the cemetery yep. there. <laughs> well, anyway, in some of your other books, you have commented about your mother being a deckhand. You have now set, is it two or three books on uh, two. fishing boats? Two. Okay. Yeah. The new one, the, the new Brown. one. Yeah, the, the first one, Dead in the Water, was on a crab fishing boat in the winter, and this is on a, a salmon tender in the summer, and Kate is deckhanding for her uncle, old Sam Dementiev, whom... I believe we might have met for, well, actually, I think we met him for the first time just in passing in A Cold Day for Murder, but he's becoming much more of a character, uh, much more of a uh, part of the series ensemble <laughs> in Breakup. And so she's working for him and killing grounds, and this uh, really seriously nasty fisherman whom everybody hates winds up dead, and Kate finds the body, and it's not really a question of who killed him, but who didn't. <laughs> Yes, you did populate the um, the area with any number of people who had reason to take him out. It was kind of Christy Esch in that sense. You know, you had um, this kind of Thank close... Thank you. Well, it was. You know, you had this kind of nice closed circle, except <laughs> instead of a country house, it was the fishing community, mm -hmm. the... the uh, 
uh, commercial mm -hmm. fishing community, and then you had this plethora of suspects. Um, it was very much like populating one of those house parties. I never thought know. of it as a country house mystery, but you're right. <laughs> yeah, it is, yes. <laughs> it's really the same structure, and um, it has the most wonderful motive, which of course we aren't going to reveal, which I like. It's always wonderful to find a book that has something not run of the mill, something, and especially something that is organic to, to the story and the setting, mm -hmm. which I liked a lot. You've Thank got you. uh, Kate's Crazy Andes up, uh -huh. the, up the river. <laughs> Um, and They're you, not so crazy. Well, no, <laughs> they really aren't. <laughs> no. Foxy, maybe is what I should have <laughs> yes. said. Like, uh, but you do, you do point out the plight. Uh, while it, while it is, I agree with you, primarily entertainment. Nonetheless, it's extremely clear from reading it what the plight of the commercial fishermen in Alaska is when you think about the lucrative sport fishing, mm -hmm. which is a major problem. Fish farms, which mm -hmm. are taking away some of their. Um, uh -huh. uh, demand by, right by now, satisfying yeah. it elsewhere, and also the uh, the question of native uh -huh. fishing rights, which preempt them as well. And I think you know when you've got this frontier and you've got this clash of competing interests, it's you know a natural. It's a natural. Spot. Oh, it's just it, the potential for friction in the Alaska fishing community is just, it's immense. I just, I barely scratched the surface in Killing Grounds. I could have written a story around any one mm -hmm. of those issues instead of, you know, encompassing them all. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> again, we could spend the whole hour talking about that. Uh, I was, I've got sort of a toe in all of them, and I can see a lot of the different points of view. Uh, very strong for commercial fishing, fishing because God, I was raised in the middle of those guys, and there's a reason they make that much money. It's that's the actuarial tables, I, as I understand it, for insurance companies. Mm -hmm. They they won't even write insurance policies on the life expectancies of uh, fishermen in Alaska because it's just so inherently such a dangerous job. And then, <clears throat> so they're out there scrabbling around for a living, and they're, you know, the salmon stocks crash, are crashing, and they're tr scrambling around trying to look for a reason for it. Oh, duh, they've got all those trawlers out in the donut hole in the North Pacific Ocean literally scraping up the bottom of the sea and every living thing along with it, and that's where the king crab and the salmon go to breed and, you know, reproduce and then come. You used to be able to catch king crab in Saldovia Bay in Seldovia Bay, which is a little bay off Kachemak Bay, off Lower Cook Inlet, which feeds into the Gulf of Alaska. You can't now. There are no king crab in Seldovia Bay. There are no king crab in Kachemak Bay. There are no king crab in Cook Inlet anymore. And now, just last year, the salmon stocks crashed in Bristol Bay, and they're scrambling around looking for a reason. <laughs> you don't have to look very far. Mm -hmm. Well, those trawlers, there's a ripple effect. <laughs> there's a ripple effect way up to the, the sports fisherman on the Kenai River and to Katie Johns on the Copper River. She's this uh, Athabascan lady whose uh, case I based um, the Antis predicament in Killing Grounds on. She's a, she went back to fish on her, um, uh, the fish camp and the old traditional site. Hundreds of years her family had been going there for fish camp and she went back there one year and the fish and game came by and said, you can't do that. And she said, want to bet? And she sued him. And she sued him all the way to the Supreme Court. And she won. <laughs> Good for her. Yeah. <laughs> She's a great old gal. <laughs> um, so the potential for friction among all these people fighting over this resource, it's immense. It's just immense. It's Who's manning the trawlers? Um, just about everyone. Uh, there's plenty of American trawlers in there. And there are Japanese trawlers, and the uh, Japanese appetite for seafood is practically insatiable. Korean as well. The Asians eat. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the biggest buyers for the um, uh, the catch, the North Pacific Ocean catch. But there, I think there have been there, yes, definitely been Russian trawlers and Taiwanese trawlers. And God, you know, I heard this, but I couldn't swear to it. I think there were even Polish trawlers out there for a while. But there are these huge processing ships that have nets that are literally between one and two miles long, and they drag on the bottom of the ocean and they scoop up everything in their path, every living thing. And we're talking, you know, thousands of feet below the water, so there's a hell of a t uh, pressure change by the time you get, up, get them up on deck, which means everything's probably dead by the time you get them up on deck. So it doesn't matter if you're not supposed to catch them and you throw them back, they're already dead. They're not going to do any good by throwing them back in the ocean. Of course they do. You know, that's their sop to the, to the, you know, keeping the stocks going. 